you have to be really clear on what your reason why is, you know, whether that's the mission for your business or for yourself personally, because if you've not got that clarity, you don't provide the best offering in terms of the product and services, and you have to know your customer inside out. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, you know, to be successful in business, being re- really clear on what you, what you, what you stand for, what your values are, the customer that you're serving allows you then to really differentiate yourself in the marketplace uh, because otherwise, I think a lot of businesses, they they maybe have a kind of a view, but it's not so crystal clear. And therefore, they can't, you know, communicate that clearly to their teams, to, you know, to their suppliers, to their customers, etc. So I think that is one thing to, to be successful in business. You absolutely have to. You have to know where you're heading. You're listening to The Mission Makers Show, a podcast that inspires humans to get into the mindset of success. My name's Farah Nanji, and I'm the founder of a business in the motorsports industry that explores leadership lessons from things like Formula One. I'm also a DJ and music producer in the underground electronic scene, and a public speaker on key topics like resilience, building high-performance teams, overcoming learning difficulties, and stimulating creativity. And to tie it all together, I love writing thought-provoking content as a journalist for these industries which are so unique in themselves. On this show, I'm sitting down with some of the most inspiring and driven people I've met around the world to talk about their processes, their failures, the lessons they've learned, and how they are truly making an impact for this world. Today we're joined by corporate CEO turned entrepreneur with a multi-million pound business portfolio, Jeanette Linfit. Her experience spans three decades in the travel, leisure, hospitality and property sectors, winning several awards along the way, including one of the most influential women in travel. She's also an incredible mentor and host of her own podcast, Brave, Bold and Brilliant, which goes from the boardroom tables of big international businesses to the dining room tables of entrepreneurial startups. Today's episode is packed full of nuggets on how to overcome challenges, embrace opportunities and take risks in business while staying true to yourself. So just before we begin, if you're interested in some really cool rewards like virtual DJ lessons, the chance to ask our guest questions and exclusive merchandise, head over to patreon.com forward slash mission makers to check out how you can access these exclusive rewards. And thank you to all of you been writing into us and subscribing to the show. It really does make a difference. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you love the content that we're making here at Mission Makers and help us take this show to the next level this season. Hey, Jeanette, welcome to Mission Makers. How are you doing today? I am doing excellent. Thank you, Farah. Nice to be here. Yeah, definitely. We're really looking forward to uh, speaking with you today. Um, So one of the first questions we sort of like to ask is, you know, taking it right back to the beginning. And you've had an incredible career, which has spanned travel, leisure, property um, and hospitality and, 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 and much more beyond that as well. Um, And you've, you've really sort of not only just been in them, but you've, you've, you've sort of been at the lead at the helms of leadership in these uh, industries. So what kind of sparked your interest, you know, towards these, uh, towards these industries? Well, I did an economics degree way back when. So that was quite a good grounding, really, to open up the world of business because it was broad enough to, you know, appeal to whichever direction I was going to go in. But um, so that was kind of pretty helpful. But in terms of the travel industry, where I spent a big proportion of my career, uh, well, who doesn't like to travel? I'm naturally Mm -hmm. curious about different cultures in the world, etc. But it's it's a business that's very much predicated on relationships. Um, as well and you know it's interesting because when you're talking about the travel industry and holidays clearly you know you are making a big difference to people's lives when they go away but it's a very very tough business environment because the margins are very thin so you know you have to be very very savvy and of course you're affected by global shocks etc so really from my point of view I have never been the kind of person to just tick along um, so I love the challenge I love the variety the industry has been great and of course it started with sort of a love for business really if you like and a love for people in different cultures mm. uh, so that's how my my uh, proportion of my time in the travel industry kind of started really so yeah and it's been great during that is has there been a culture that surprised you 
Um, I think, yeah, I mean, it, the travel industry is interesting because on the outside, it's seen as very much a fun industry and, and quite frivolous almost, you know, because you're talking about holidays and sunshine and exotic places in the world. Um, but the reality is from a business point of view, it, it is quite, it is a very tough environment. And certainly, you know, when I started my earlier career, you know, I started on a graduate scheme and worked my way up to ultimately becoming the CEO of the travel division. For, for a company called Saga, where I had, you know, 400 million of turnover, 1,700 people on my team. But, you know, when I actually shifted from being in the, in the business to being in the boardroom, shall we say, you know, I very often was the only woman in the boardroom with a profit and loss account. Uh, so, you know, that was quite an interesting dynamic for me, sort of navigating what was quite an alpha male environment, given that the industry is actually 75 percent female as an average. But it drops off a cliff when you get into those very, very senior executive roles. Mm. So, yeah, that was an interesting dynamic because people wouldn't necessarily perceive um, the difference there. It's, it's changed a lot far over the years, but mm. um yeah, I mean, I, I had a great career and I, uh, I, never, um, I never saw the negative. I just did the best job I could. And so I, I was OK. But it, for some people, it could be quite intimidating and certainly was at certain times for me as well. You know, are you are you quite glad you're, you, you didn't have to sort of withstand the shock of COVID on the travel industry? Well, I'm, st I'm still in the sector, actually, because what I have now, I have a portfolio of businesses and one of my businesses is advisory. Mm. So what I do, I do a lot of mergers and acquisitions in the travel, leisure, hospitality space. So actually, I was working on three deals pre-COVID mm. where I was buying two travel businesses for a corporate client and then one for a private equity house. Now, of course, when COVID hit, all of those deals were just off. You know, they were just on pause because very difficult to value and buy a travel business during a global pandemic so even though I wasn't running a business uh, on, uh, you know day in day out as a, as a CEO like I had been I was still sort of very I'm still very much in the industry so yeah it's been it's been really difficult it's been a terrible time I mean similar to you know the sectors that you're in far in terms of you know the the sort of sport and music sectors hospitality and leisure have been you know two of the sectors you know most affected actually globally so it's been tough hasn't it for everyone yeah it has, yeah. One of the first to sort of close down, and certainly one of the last to come back as well. I mean, we're we're still here, and it's uh, it's still a lot of um, businesses closed and, and all of that stuff. Um, going back to your sort of childhood, were you always purpose driven, or is that, is that something that came later in life? Was there something that maybe happened, or or were you always quite ambitious and quite sort of hungry to to make an impact on this world? I think I always was actually for it. But it's interesting because I grew up in a very normal family, you know, a very loving family. I had a great childhood, you know, growing up in Manchester. You can probably tell from my dulcet tones. Um, and I was the youngest of three girls in my family. So I was the only one to go to university. Um, you know, my elder sisters, they they took a more traditional route. You know, they stayed local to Manchester. They settled down, had beautiful families and, you know, and had, had success in their own way. But they weren't necessarily like I was in the respect of I knew there was a big wide world out there and I wanted to explore it so I guess I was I was always a bit of a, a geek you know I always worked hard I had a very strong work ethic which I thank my parents for um, but yeah I guess I was a bit of a black sheep really because I was the one that was sort of ready to leave and go out and explore and um, yeah sort of always been good with numbers and the commercial side of businesses so that's where I, I ended up and ultimately becoming a CEO of some very large businesses but yeah I grew up from a very normal humble beginnings um, very lucky to have a loving family we didn't want for anything but we certainly weren't born into you know a wealth position at all you know so so yeah I think I've always been quite ambitious or well, very ambitious but maybe when I was younger I didn't exactly know what that looked like I just knew there was more <laughs> <laughs> yeah we were talking off air about how much Manchester's developed as well so it must be quite exciting because it's it's become a you know a very sort of sophisticated and um, a lot of movement happening uh, over there as well the the meaning of your name Jeanette is uh, God is gracious. Um, and we like to ask our guests, you know, like, has then the meaning of their name ever played any me like sort of subconscious or conscious role towards their journey or like sort of how they live their life, perhaps? Has it has it ever had an influence on you? 
Oh gosh, well, what a brilliant question. I have never been asked that question. So that is a first and I've been interviewed many, many times. So yeah, well done on the on, a, on an innovative question. So I guess, um, I guess the, the short answer is not consciously, no, because I haven't thought of it in that way. And I'm not necessarily a particular religious person, but I am quite a spiritual person, mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm very, I'm very sort of, conscious around you know positive mindset and I really believe if you raise your vibration you can attract you know positive things to you so I'm very sort of spiritual I think there's something out there um which is is kind of guiding us it but you have to have an open mind to that mm. so I think there's there's certainly an element of that um and then when it the gracious part I guess I, I've always been very appreciative of you know other people and the opportunities I've been given you know I was brought up with with great values around you know never taking things for granted treat other people as you would like to be treated you know be kind when you can uh, help other people and, and that's certainly you know values that have stayed with me through my whole career in business life and personal life so yeah I didn't think of it in that way Farah but as you've brought it up maybe it has been subconsciously guiding me <laughs> mm, very interesting yeah, it's definitely I believe a lot in energy as well so really interesting to hear your perspective on that and um, and the, yeah the duality within that as well so you once stated that um, the concept of your podcast came from a belief that we all have a greatness within us and with the, with the right mindset and by being brave, bold and brilliant, which is the name of your podcast, um, we can achieve anything we want in business, um, in our lives, in our careers. So these are, you know, very powerful words. How do you personally sort of put that ethos um, into practice? Well, I think, I mean, I, I like to believe that I, I, you know, I lead by example. You know, I, I would never ask someone else to do something I'm not prepared to do myself or have done. So on a daily basis, um, I, I challenge myself, you know, and uh, I, I push out of my comfort zone. And I've always wanted to make an impact on this world. Mm. So, you know, when I decided to leave corporate world, for example, um, which was about three years ago, I didn't have a full roadmap of where I was going to head, but I knew that I was in my mid forties and that actually the next phase of my life was really important and that I wanted to make an impact. And where that led me was essentially to setting up a portfolio of my own businesses. So really going from that big corporate CEO um, sort of personality and type to becoming very much an entrepreneur. Now to walk away from a very, you know, a very uh, positive and strong position where you're well rewarded to jump out of that into into not knowing what was next um, was quite brave of me at the time. And, you know, I continue to do that in terms of pushing forward, et cetera. And, and as I say, the bold, I... I do a lot of what I do is to give back and to help other people unlock their potential because I want to make an impact. I want to leave the world a better place than when I when I came into it. And I think the way I can do that is by helping others unlock their potential. So I do this why I do the podcast, you know, to provide inspiration and content for people. It's why I do my mentoring one to one to really help people scale up and grow. You know, it's why I do my really my advisory work with businesses to help them again get to that next level so yeah I think I lead I lead by example with those three words now we can't be brilliant every day can we because that's just not real life we all have good days and bad days but I really try very hard to move forward and progress so that you know when I go to bed at night I feel like I've achieved something with the day I've made a positive impact on someone else's life and you know I can I can kind of rest easy mm. and know that I'm fundamentally a good person that's trying to do the best for others mm, absolutely I love it and so you mentioned they're going out of your comfort zone what what do you like to do to kind of to get yourself out of the norm and, and challenge your limits well, in business, um, a great example, actually. So we'd, um, I was explaining when we were just chatting before we started, you know, I spent 27 years living in London, which is a city that I absolutely love. Uh, myself and my partner, Chris, we have a property investment business and we've been investing in properties in Manchester. So we just decided, okay, 
let's leave our lovely home in uh, in London and we'll relocate up to Manchester because that's where we need to be for the business. Um, so we've been doing, been up here for 12 months and we've now just decided um, we are also going to expand into the luxury holiday let market down in South mm-hmm. Wales. So we've decided again, let's move again because <laughs> we need to be where we can have the biggest impact. So, you know, a lot of people, the thought of leaving their, you know, place they love, packing up, um, you know, dealing with renting the property out and all this kind of thing to actually throw yourself into a new business venture um, definitely pushes out of my comfort zone from a business point of view. But I know that even if we don't achieve everything we want, we will have moved forward. We'll have learned Mm. something. Hopefully the business will be successful and I'm sure it will be with that sort of evolution. But actually, if you don't try, you'll never know. So you know, I think it's so important that we, we do, we do feel the fear, but take the action anyway. Um, so that's just one area, one example, really. Um, and then when it comes to things like, you know, fitness, um, you know, I, I never used to be a runner. Um, Mm -hmm. I remember running my first mile and practically crying, you know, (laughs) now I love running. It's the best thing that I could ever do. But, you know, at the Mm -hmm. time, you know, it was it was something new and different. So, yeah, I just think life's so exciting and you can do whatever you want. You've just got to be clear on what it is, uh, believe in yourself and take the action. And that's the main thing. Take the action because so many people talk a good talk, but they don't actually follow up with um, with, with mm-hmm. taking the action, you know. <laughs> absolutely absolutely I, I love it I love it um and I, I think you know perhaps a lot of that also even comes from from the curiosity to travel and when you travel you are out of your comfort zone you're in an unknown territory unknown culture and um and it, and, and I can resonate a lot with just kind of packing up and going somewhere and not being intimidated by by that and just knowing what the right things are to like make yourself feel at home once you're you know in that environment so um, wishing you all the best for that move down to South Wales. It's a beautiful part of the country. Um, and uh, yeah, great place to do a luxury um, sort of uh, uh, business as well. So through your podcast, and uh, and I know you're a, you know, um, a mentor as well, um, what have been some of your key observations and experiences of, um, of building a business and, and doing it with success? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot to this, isn't there? I think yeah. the the common theme that I find is that you know you have to be really clear on what your reason why is, you know, whether that's the mission for your business or for yourself personally. Because if you've not got that clarity, you don't provide the best offering in terms of the product and services, and you have to know your customer inside out. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think you know to be successful in business, being re- really clear on what you what you what you stand for, what your values are the customer that you're serving allows you then to really differentiate yourself in the marketplace uh, because otherwise I think a lot of businesses they they maybe have a kind of a view but it's not so crystal clear and therefore they can't you know communicate that clearly to their teams to you know to their suppliers to their customers etc so I think that is one thing to, to be successful in business you absolutely have to you have to know where you're heading. Um, the second thing I would say is you've got to be all over your numbers. Mm-hmm. You have to know your numbers, you know, and, and actually if you're a small business owner, you know, I I've, I see both sides for it because I've run very large corporate organizations, you know, FTSE 100, FTSE 250 listed businesses. But I'm, I also know what it's like to be an entrepreneur as well. But what I see with small and mid-sized businesses is very often they're not so close to their numbers and cash flow is not, is very often what causes a business to fail. So you, you do have to have that rigor, that discipline and that structure. Even if you're a small business, you still need to have the right financial metrics in place and be reviewing that so you're all over your numbers. And then the third area really is all is, and it's not the last area, all of these are important, uh, is the people, Mm. you know, because what's the saying, if you, if you want to go fast, go alone, if you want to go far, go together. And I really believe that, you know, who you spend time with, who you have on your team, the people that you um, bring with you on the journey is ultimately what will allow you to be successful, but also for them to be successful. So I think, you know, a combination of those aspects has always stood me in good stead when it's come to business. And, and I guess the other thing as a leader is, you know, be authentic, 
be yourself, you know, accept that you can't know everything. And that is actually a strength as a leader to bring, you know, talent in, but to, to, to not, not shy away from the authenticity of who you are. Um, because actually people by people, they buy into leaders that show their vulnerability. Um, so I think that's something that, again, I've got better at over the years, which comes with a little bit of maturity, I think sometimes as well. Mm, very solid uh, advice and I 100% agree with with everything you said there talking a bit about clarity I'm sure you get asked this question um, uh, sometimes and uh, and I'm curious to know what your sort of exp um, what your advice would be to others because I've been asked this question as well and um, you know I, I think similar to me or you're, you're extremely purpose-driven you know you found your sort of your whys and the industries that you gravitate towards um, and I think sometimes you know it's lucky enough to know what you're passionate about but then of course having the um, enabling that pa that passion and having all the stars aligned for you to go after is also extremely important. But you know there are a lot of people who who struggle to find their actual purpose. You know here and um, what what advice do you would you give to somebody who who isn't sure sort of what what really their 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 purpose is? You know their passion. Yeah, I think I think the first thing I would say is it's sort of okay to not know for, for a period of time because you know if we're all really honest, I don't think we at every single point of our careers, business life, and personal lives we've always known exactly what we want. You know, we might know a little bit. So I think the first thing is I would say give yourself a break. <laughs> if you don't know, that's that's you know don't beat yourself up. But take the time to get clear, because when you have clarity, everything changes. So on a very practical basis, I mean, what I take my uh, mentee uh, clients through actually very often is what I call a, like a vision cascade model. So we start with the big purpose, you know, and there's some really meaty questions in there. You know, what is your reason why? Who do you want to become? What legacy do you want to, you know, to leave for your, your, your children, your family, et cetera? You know, what do you want written on your gravestone? You know, there's some pretty big, big things because this is important. But that that big picture, if you can get clear on what's really important to you there, then you can start to break that down into sort of focus areas and then break it down into, you know, key objectives and actions that you're going to take. So you can really cascade it down from the top to the bottom. But sometimes those questions are quite daunting. So another thing I recommend to people, if you don't know, if you're struggling to answer those big questions, start from the bottom up and literally get a blank sheet of paper and do a brainstorm of all the things you want all the things you want in life, all the things you want to become. And they could be the smallest things or the biggest things. You know, it could be, I want to start a charity in Africa. You know, it could be, I actually really like that, that red pair of um, Louboutin shoes that I saw, or it could be that, you know, actually, I just want to have, I want to have more time with my kids, you know, whatever it might be, get it all out of your head and onto paper. And then once you've done that brain dump, you can start to group things together and then that will help you then then revisit those bigger questions and hopefully help you get the clarity of what you really want. Um, and I think after you've got that, you can then start to be quite ruthless and ask yourself how you're spending your time, who you're spending time with, and is that serving you? Is it actually moving you towards your dreams or is it taking you further away or stopping you? Um, so yeah, those are just some some sort of uh, the ways that I've approached it over the years to help me get clear. And I, I'm a big believer in your the, the routines in the morning as well. You know, I spend a lot of time you know, I, I spend some time in silence. I do my affirmations, you know, whether that's in the shower saying, oh, I want to be a multimillionaire or I want to be a better mother or whatever it might be. You know, I say it out loud and then you start to train your subconscious brain that this is a reality. And then I'm a big believer in visualization as well, you know, manifesting what that future future world looks like. And then I think you raise your vibration you, and magical things start to happen. But you have to take the action, of course, as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's very true. You have to get kind of get out of your head a little bit and, and put it on paper um, and then sort of come at it from from that sort of angle, because it can be overwhelming. There's so many options there's so many interesting things to do. You know, time is short. Um, but, you yeah, know, that's some really, really good advice. Um, so thank you for sharing that. You touched upon earlier, you know, being um, in industries that are 
sort of quite although actually they have a lot of females in them the actual when you get to towards the top there's there's a not not that many uh females and you know here we are living in the uk obviously a progressive country but diversity is still um a prevalent issue um yep. I know it's a topic that you're quite um you're, you're quite passionate to champion so when you're sort of advising or you're or you're in in that sort of um driving seat what what do you believe are sort of the top ways that a leader can integrate that sort of inclusivity and diversity into their agenda? Yeah, I mean, I think there, there's two things. There's there's what can an organization do to ensure that you have a diverse and inclusive culture? And then there's what can you as an individual do? And both play a part. So I'm going to talk about, I'll talk about it from a perspective of gender and um, mm-hmm. equality, if you like. But this equally stands for, you know, sexual orientation or racial uh, background, anything really in terms of the wider diversity and inclusion. So I'm massively passionate about it. But I think as an organization, it has to start from the top. Now, it doesn't start and and finish there. It has to permeate throughout the whole organization. But as a leader, you have to, in my opinion, fully buy into the, the perspective and the point that diverse teams not only is the right thing to do from a societal point of view, but also achieve better results. And it's proven. It's proven time and time again. The commercial case is that, you know, Um, organizations that have diverse boards and diverse leadership teams and diverse management teams perform better financially. So the commercial case should be clear, right? It it amazes me that we still talk about this stuff, to be honest, but anyway, we are. So I think that, you know, you have as a leader, you have to really fully buy into it yourself. And then I'm a I'm a massive believer that, you know, what gets measured gets done. Now, I'm not saying I believe in quotas. So it's a different thing. Mm. But if you have a strategic priority for diversity and inclusion, then that must be on the agenda of your board meetings every month or at least every quarter. And it needs to be a standing item so that you can actually track progress and how you're how you're doing, because if it's not visible, it will get forgotten it's not enough just to put a statement out there and then not to take action that's going to move you from a to b so it has to be a strategic priority it has to be on the agenda and um, then you need a whole set of initiatives to ensure that you're creating the right culture and the right environment for diversity to flourish so let's talk about you know if you're talking about gender diversity that could be return return from maternity programs for working mums for example it could be flexible working or for 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 dads as well you know let's let's face it you know parenting is not just down to, to it's not just a female responsibility but you know you have to have policies procedures in place that allow a diverse culture to flourish you know and very often it takes years to build this you know so what's your recruitment policy how are you bringing talent into the business at the more junior level so they will become the future directors and the future ceos so there's a whole bunch of stuff in there around the business and the responsibility as a leader. And I really feel so strongly that this is, this is where we should be. We shouldn't even be talking about this stuff anymore. It should be even a non, a non-topic, but it unfortunately it is, you know, and if you think about the top 100 companies in the UK, the FTSE 100 businesses, 6% have female CEOs, 6%. You know, that I mean, that is crazy in today's world. This is 2021. And yet when um, boys and girls or men and women graduate from university, it's more or less 50 50. So something happens <laughs> between your early 20s. And let's just say you're let's say most people are sort of late 30s before they get to that sort of level. Something happens and there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes on. But, you know, those are pretty shocking stats. Mm. Now, we have moved forward significantly. I can't say we haven't in terms of, you know, diversity and inclusion, but there's still some way to go. We've made more progress with gender. Uh, diversity but we've made less progress when it comes to you know uh, cultural uh, lgbtq um, diversity you know when it comes to people with disabilities hidden or or, or visible disabilities so there's still a long way to go but i think those core principles for me is what needs to happen but then i would also say the flip side um to the the answer to the question is around what does the individual do to ensure that they are, um, you know, putting themselves in the the best foot forward, really. Mm. So, and some of this is behavioral, some of it is cultural. So, 
what I tend to see a lot in particular with women is that even if, you know, they, they will have the capability to do a job, but they don't always believe it themselves. So it's coming back to that mindset, that self-belief, you know, so being brave, uh, which is one of the key words in, in my podcast, you know, as a woman, sometimes you do have to be a little bit braver maybe, and, you know, push yourself forward, go for the promotion, keep your hand up, is what I say, you know, don't, don't shy away, present yourself in the right way, but, but don't back off because if you do, you know, you, you won't get seen and, you know, you wouldn't, you shouldn't leave your career development or your, or your business in the hands of somebody else. You do have to put yourself in the way of opportunity, you know, and that might be volunteering for a certain project or going for a promotion. If you don't get the promotion, asking for the feedback, you know, actually negotiating an increase in your package or salary etc you know tends to be it's not 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 always the case but it does tend to be that men are a little bit more confident at doing this um you know they won't they will look at a, a guy would look at an in, um an advert for a job and they maybe they can do 70 percent of the job and maybe there's 30 percent they haven't got direct experience of they'll ignore the 30% and go for it anyway, right? Whereas as a female, a more typical response is focusing on the 30% that you can't do and maybe not even applying for the job. You know, so so as I say, I'm making a bit of a generalization, Farah, but there, there's certain, some behavioral stuff as well. And this is where having mentors, coaches, people in your life, role models that can kind of help you. You know, I'm a big believer in my career. I've always, you know, if you think you're you're kind of climbing the ladder in your in your your career in your business, I'm a big believer at, at, at putting my hand down to pull the next woman up. Definitely. And I think that is a responsibility um, that each and every one of us should should take take forward um, because it's so important that we do that, whether it's, major, as I say, any any aspect of diversity. What are you doing personally to help the next person progress their career? What are you, what are you doing? Or are you perpetuating, you know, behaviours that have been in longstanding in an organisation? So hand on heart, are you doing enough? Mm. Um, are mm. you doing enough as a leader? Are you doing enough as an individual? Because you mm. have to also walk the walk and talk the talk I believe so um sorry it's quite a lot in there Farah but I'm really passionate about it it's something I've spent many years um you know moving moving hopefully moving the dial in a small way that I, I can throughout all of this hey you we hope you're enjoying today's episode we're on a serious mission here to create one of the world's best podcast series and we'd be so grateful if you could support us in any way by becoming a patron of the show there's a tier to suit every level, from early bird tiers where you get downloads to all my music with some super cool ninja stickers, to our VIP mission maker tiers where you get epic rewards like exclusive footage that never gets aired, the chance to submit questions to our guests with signed copies of books from them, DJ lessons, one-to-one -one coaching and a whole load of super cool ninja and mission maker merchandise. You can start supporting us for less than what it costs you to fill up your car for a month by simply heading over to www.patreon.com forward slash mission makers. Thanks for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. No, absolutely. I I, I'm, I, I love um, everything that you're saying and it's great to hear the, the passion come through and, you know, like the industries I'm in also are extremely uh, male dominated. I think in music, it's like 2% of producers are female, which is just, you know, absurd and you, and you come across you know you come sometimes come across um extremely ridiculous statements you know of belief actual belief that you know women can't actually produce and all that stuff which is just ridiculous because it's a skill set it's not something determined by your gender but something you said there about you know the six percent um in these sort of large corporations corporations sorry uh being at the c-suite level um do, you know when you're in the travel industry do did you feel that there's like a resistance? I mean, we're still today hearing about issues like with BA, um, you know, these kind of issues coming up about this diversity and inclusion topic and, and seeing that, you know, a company that represents our nation at the end of the day, um, you know, sort of has, has these uh, biased views. Um, do you, did you ever sort of see a resistance in the travel industry towards that, towards that topic? You know, I, I mean, my personal experience, even though, as I say, I was very often the only woman in the boardroom, I didn't have a, a, a very negative personal experience. You know, I've had I've been very lucky 
connected to have had amazing male bosses and amazing female bosses as well throughout my career. So I've been very lucky in that sense. Um, so I think it's more when I was in that position, it was more endemic. It was more historic, if you like. Um, and I, I'd like to think the world has changed significantly. You know, if you take, say, EasyJet as an airline, and I know Johan Lundgren, who is the group CEO very well. I interviewed him for my podcast, actually, and also um, a lady called Chris Brown, who was the chief operating officer for EasyJet. You know, they may, had a strategic priority to get more female pilots into, into, the, into, the, um, into EasyJet. Nice. So they set a very overt target for that. And, you know, they took action action to absolutely which started with going into schools you know with f- to, to speak to to you know men and work, good boys and girls in schools in education to say listen you could be a pilot too do not think just because you're a woman that you can't achieve this so you know and, and easy jet I don't know what the exact numbers are now I'm probably slightly out of date but they're certainly north of 20%. You know, they pretty much was like 1% female pilots and they've really shifted the dial. Now there's still some way to go, but that's a good example where, you know, in aviation uh, and in, in a sector that had been very male dominated, the same with engineers, you know, and equally, I would like to see more fem- more male HR directors you know, because again, there's so few mm. actually. So it's the other way, you know, so, so, so gender um, inequality isn't just all about, you know, female inequality, it's, it's men as well. You know, if you think about male nurses, you know, the, there's a very, again, a much smaller proportion yet, you know, why can't a man be as, as good a nurse as a, as, a, as a woman? Of course he can, you know? So I think it's, it's not just one-sided, but yeah, I never had a personal problem, but there, there is still a, an imbalance. And I think that a lot of that comes down to the pipeline of getting people, getting women into those sort of junior management, then middle management, and then senior management roles, you know, preparing them for the boardroom. But also, you know, as as women, you know, a lot of women will take a break to have children. So how do you make sure that during that time, a woman isn't disconnected from the from the business, and that they are welcome back in, and they're able to actually do that in a way that has flexibility, so where that whereby they can, you know, still do a great job but also be a great mum um mm. you know so I think a lot of it is down to historic issues that have been around a long time where you know the dial is changing thankfully but it does take time for that to come through and to actually show up in reality because you know if I think about my career you know I got my first c-suite role when I was um in my early 30s you know so from from graduate that's 10 years you know, before naturally you're going to have the experience and the knowledge to be in a position like that. So it doesn't just happen overnight, unfortunately. Um, but but having said that, I see, you know, in the world that I'm in now of property investing, that actually is is pretty equal. You know, so not so much when it comes to, you know, builders and, and trades people as such. That still is and more biased towards men. But from a property investment point of view, it's pretty 50 50, mm. actually, men and women. And that is partly because, you know, you can actually invest in property and be very, very successful investor with a building a significant significant portfolio of properties like like we like we've done um, and you don't have to do a nine to five to do that you can fit it around your other um you know your other priorities and your other commitments so you know that in itself demonstrates it's you've got to have the right environment to to allow men and women to be able to be their whole selves and be able to fulfill their other responsibilities at the same time as their business responsibilities yeah no 100 percent. and yes i think it's extremely important that the messages that you're you're exposed to as a child um you know is is it it, it challenges the norm and it, it as you say it sort of shows you can be that that female pilot you can be that raf fighter you know if you want the world really is is your oyster and then once you're there and you've got to that position as you say um or even when you haven't got to that position just throughout that journey like helping the the, the people you know who are also on a similar trajectory and uh, and it makes a huge 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 difference to have that um to have that support network behind you um so a hundred hundred percent you mentioned earlier about sort of being you know coming from that corporate sort of lens and then and then and then suddenly changing to like sort of the entrepreneurship journey so 
what sort of sparked your desire to kind of get out of that um, environment and uh, and just totally sort of take take the plunge? Did you feel maybe you, you achieved what you wanted to, or the challenges weren't weren't there anymore, or like what what was the sort of the spark towards that? Yeah, interesting question. Well, you know, I was never one of these people that said they hated their jobs, they hated the corporate world. You know, you do hear that a lot in the entrepreneurial space. So that wasn't me. I always loved the the roles I've done. I've you know, had a, a fabulous uh, career in the corporate world. You know, I mean, I think about it, gosh, you know, I was buying and running businesses in Russia, China, India, all over the world. I remember going, being, you know, tapped on the shoulder and saying, hey, do you fancy going to Russia to buy three businesses for two? I mean, I'd never bought a business. I didn't speak Russian. I just thought, oh, well, you know, how bad can it be? I'll give it a go, you know. So the experiences that I've had, I'm very grateful for in the corporate life. But I guess where I was, I got to my mid 40s and I'd been very successful in my corporate life you know I'd got to become CEO which I really wanted to do I wanted to make an impact uh, turn a business turn businesses around and and, and really you know create amazing experiences for, for our customers and for the teams etc and get the financial results so I, I'd achieved a lot um, but I got to my mid 40s and I kind of thought well what do I want from this next phase of my life? And, you know, I, we don't have kids, actually, but m- myself and my partner, Chris, Chris is 10 years older than me. So, um, you know, not that he's an old fart or anything, you know, <laughs> he's really, really cool. And, and we're in really good health. So very f- fortunate for that. But Chris had retired from his corporate life and we were t- and he's 10 years older. So you, you do naturally think, well, what's what's the next phase for us? And at that age, you're kind of you've got all of that knowledge experience under your belt. You're much more self-aware of kind of who you are as a person and what you really want from life. And, you know, you, you, but you're aware that you, the next few years are the next 10, 20 years are quite important because you are, I hate to say it, gosh, you're, you're so much younger than me. I'm very jealous, but you know, you, you are mid, I'm middle aged and I go, oh my God, how did that happen? I can't believe I'm the age I am. So you're sort of got all this knowledge experience, but then you, you're aware of your mortality as well. And that, you know, time counts when you, when you're in your twenties, you just trot along and you enjoy life and you, you know, it's different, but when you get to your forties and your fifties, it does feel different. So yeah. So I, I uh, we sat down and said, actually, what do we want? And we wanted freedom choice, flexibility. We wanted to um, have multiple streams of income so that I wasn't just, you know, relying on one source of income. I mean, I was always very well rewarded for the roles that I did. So don't get me wrong. Um, But you still have to exchange your time for money. You don't get paid that money if you don't turn up. Um, so, so you know, the, our decision to go into property in particular, and we'd, we'd always done uh, various property investments over the years, but not significantly as a proper business, was to create passive income. Because essentially, you know, if, if you invest in property, um, you know, you, it's not, it sounds a little bit simple, this, but you do make money while you sleep. Mm. Um, you know, and you don't have to be exchanging your time for money. Plus, you've got the growth in, you know, in terms of equity growth and the value of the properties, etc. So it's not always easy. But once you get going and you, you've you established yourself, it's a great way to not, you know, to have money coming in, even when you don't have to actually turn up for work. Mm. Um, so that then gives you freedom, choice, flexibility. You know, I mean, I've always we've loved traveling in terms of our our professional career, but to be able to just decide, should we just go and go? What, should we just go away for three months backpacking around South America? Yeah, let's do it. We can do that. You know, that is is such a lovely position to be in. So it was really a lifestyle choice. But also, um, you know, I've made significant money for it for other businesses mm. <laughs> and I've been well rewarded. But then there comes a time where you go, you know what, let's actually invest our capital c- to create significant wealth for ourselves, mm. um, which we can then deploy for not only for the lifestyle we want to live, but also leave a really nice legacy for my nieces and nephews and to do good by other people, too. Um, mm. So, yeah, there's, there was quite a bit a bit around sort of finding what that next thing was going to be but you know now I've got three businesses so I have my board advisory business where I do a lot of mergers acquisitions advisory work I help businesses turn around and grow which I love non-exec work non-exec director work 
I then have my mentor in business because I'm really passionate about helping other people unlock their potential. We have our property investment business, which is where Chris and I run that together. And then I've got my podcast, which is a real passion uh, for me around, um, you know, because I get to speak to really interesting people and uh, learn a lot myself. So it's nice to have the variety, choice and flexibility. And I can dial up or dial down as much or as little as, as I like. Now, never say never, because if an amazing role came up and it was just too good, a, too good a, an opportunity, well, then who knows? But certainly where I am today, I feel, you know, incredibly lucky. And but I know that I've got there because of the hard work, the focus, the belief that I've worked on myself over the years. You know, no one has just sort of come along and given me this, um, you know. So, yeah, that, that was really how it how it evolved. Mm, fascinating what would be um your top tips for someone who wanted to get on onto the property ladder today yeah I mean there's so many different things that you can do with property so uh, the first thing I would say is get yourself educated you know because you, there are certain property strategies which are um a, a little less less hands-on shall we say don't require as much time commitment but maybe the returns are slightly lower or there's you know lots of property strategies which are higher cash flowing but require a bit more input of your time so i think the first thing is you need to understand where does it fit into your overall picture is it that you want to be a full time property investor over you know over a period of time or is it actually you just want to create a nice little nest egg and, and pension fund for yourself um so i think the first thing is get a little bit of clarity around what you're trying to achieve from property, get yourself educated and then decide which is going to be the right route for you. Um, and then I would just say, start. Because, <laughs> you know, the first deal you do won't necessarily be the best deal. And in fact, the chances are it won't be, but you will learn a lot. And, you know, I think it's, it's very much around um, don't wait to buy property, buy property and wait because unless you make an absolute catastrophe and there are you can make mistakes of course you can in this um, but if you buy something which is pretty solid you know over time it should go up um you know if you look at the law of averages unless you buy something in an area that's clearly you know problematic or whatever so yeah get yourself educated decide where it fits into your overall plan for your life and and kind of your business career um and then and then really yeah, get started, but you don't have to have your own money. You know, you can actually still invest in property using other people's money. So very often a blocker for, well, for people will be, well, I haven't got the cash. Well, there's different ways that you can actually finance an investment in property. So, you know, again, coming back to knowing your numbers really and what the options are available to you will mean that you can then, you know, you push out of that comfort zone of not doing it and, and just make a start. Mm. Uh, but you'll never look back. Well, I don't think you'll ever look back anyway. We certainly haven't. Mm, definitely very interesting are there any resources you could recommend to anybody who's interested on in getting towards that journey yeah there's loads actually i mean i mean the great thing in today's world is that there's a lot of free content isn't there on online you know so so there's stacks out there um i mean we actually are very well we're we're really lucky because we're mentored by um two gentlemen actually called rob moore and mark homer and they are the founders of an organization called progressive property mm -hmm. so they have a significant property portfolio themselves but they also have the largest property education business in the uk so we're mentored directly by by rob and mark so we're very lucky in that sense but actually if if you check out progressive property for example you know our facebook groups and and online there's lots of great content there that you can absorb lots of you know reading um from rob moore and mark homer in particular podcasts uh, so yeah i mean that's a natural place to start get yourself educated get into it get your head around it all um, and then go from there really but um and also now that we're out of sort of lockdown um local property Property networking groups can be a fantastic way to, to meet people that will actually one they'll they'll kind of give you some inspiration you know if you're listening to people speak etc but could also be very very useful in terms of building your network in that world so you know so property investment network is one of them 
um, you know, so have, just go on to Google and Google property property uh, network meetings wherever you are, and that will then allow you to to find those as well. So I think there's a there's a big value around being in the room with people as well and chatting and getting to know each other, etc. And you know, tell everyone what you're what you're going to do. Because when you tell people what you what you do, one, it kind of holds you accountable to a certain degree because you've put it out there to the world. <laughs> Two, if you say I'm a property investor, you know, you actually start to believe that you are, even if you're early on in your journey. Uh, and then before you know it, you know, those opportunities will come up. So networking is really important. You know, go into the estate agent, start building a relationship all of that kind of good stuff. And it's often the things that people don't talk about the most. People will talk about the deals and how big's your portfolio and what's your gross development value and all of these, what's your yields are you getting? So they'll talk about all this stuff, but they often don't talk about the foundational things that you need to do when getting into property or starting any other business, to be mm, honest. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm really passionate about it. And it's certainly allowed us to have freedom, choice, flexibility in our lives. So um, yeah, it's a great, it's a great area to get into um if you can definitely yeah the foundation is is absolutely critical um so you mentioned that you've got um you know a, a really good mentor or mentors in 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 that world um and you yourself of course are a mentor um do you have any other people that that sort of mentor you that you sort of um look up to or or get that sort of um support through yeah you know i've been really lucky throughout my career um because at different Different times I've always had mentors or coaches now the two are different you know people often use the terms interchangeably they are different a coach is someone that will ask you intelligent questions so you come up with the answer yourself and very often would be an accredited coach you know with a professional qualification um so and, and you know but may not have had direct experience in your industry or your sector a mentor is someone that essentially has been there and done it yeah. So they can advise you based on their personal experience. So I'm always very clear. I am not a coach because I'm not a qualified coach, but I am a mentor because I know what it's like to get into the boardroom. I know what it's like to buy a business, sell a business, start a business, grow a business, <laughs> navigate the corporate world, you know, because I've been there and I've done it. So as a mentor, that's really important. So for me, I've always had mentors and coaches and it's always catapulted me to the next level. So, you know, there's a gentleman who has been a, an informal mentor, gosh, since I would say 2010. Mm -hmm. actually uh, a gentleman actually probably earlier than that maybe 2008 gentleman called Richard Prosser and Richard was my boss at um, TUI so when I got approached to go to Russia it was Richard that approached me and said hey Jeanette how do you fancy going to Russia we're uh, we're investing in the emerging markets and we'd really like you to go over there and lead the whole thing so he gave me an opportunity he saw something in me back then um, that I probably didn't see myself and then all these years later he's no longer my boss we've both moved on and you know got, got sort of significantly different different lives now from where we were then but he's always been there as a guiding light for me um so he's he's wonderful he's a great sounding board very generous with his, with his time it's kind of you know evolved from being my boss to being a friend as well as a mentor so so he has been what a constant in my life for a long time but you know my partner chris um you know having a strong partner that supports you and encourages you it can make it's made a massive difference to me you know i wouldn't be where i am today if i didn't have the love support and encouragement of chris in my life you know i, I really do 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 realize that um but yeah I, I you know i love i listen to a lot of like say tony robbins i love tony robbins <laughs> i've been on a few of his trainings and, and what have you so very very different style mm. um you know so so yeah i'll be going to unleash the power within when we're back in the room over in the states next year i've got that in the calendar so i think you can get inspiration and learning from so many different people mel robbins is cool as well you know so there's so much isn't there mm -hmm. but learning from others so you don't make the same mistakes is a smart thing to do mm -hmm. yeah I, I really believe knowledge is the most valuable currency um priceless really who's a mentee that you're currently sort of developing that we should be watching out for 
oh, I can't give any names of my Ooh, individual okay, mentees. Okay, it's all it's all confidential. But what I will say is that when I work with people, they absolutely max their potential. So I've just actually had a, um, a, one of my mentees, and um, he's in the corporate world, actually. And quite recently, I've helped him navigate um, an internal promotion, which has added in excess of £150,000 to his income. So that's a huge jump up, you mm. know, um, and, and it's a real value. So it just demonstrates the value there. You know, I've got another mentee who um, in his property business has started from zero and has now got three million pounds worth of property. I've got another mentee who has got a portfolio of businesses, very successful, but is has started a new business and that's on track to turn over seven million. You know, so so actually I work with a mix of people. I, it's either entrepreneurial business owners that want to kind of have already got experience, but they want to take the business to the next level or add an extra business into their portfolio. Or I work with people who are in the executive world that essentially are already um, have already got a great career behind them, but they're they're looking for that next move normally into a C-suite role or into the boardroom. So I kind of work with two types of types of individuals. Mm. Um, but I'm about to launch a mastermind program as well, actually, which will allow me to, to be able to help more people together mm. um, because one-to-one is very intense. It's great, but there's only so many hours in the day. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'm incredibly proud of, of my mentees. In fact, I can mention one because he's actually recently done um, a public testimonial for me and that is Wayne Smith. Mm-hmm. Um, and Wayne is the founder of a company called Olympia Boxing. And what he does, he is community boxing. So he goes into, it really makes a difference in schools, young people how they can get into boxing for their mental health or what you know and fitness etc he's absolutely knocking it out of the park um, and he's also a property investor as well so he's nice. got multiple businesses so yeah there's so many so many uh so many uh, opportunities when you work closely with someone to, to really you know step up Absolutely, definitely. So we're moving into our uh, audience Q&A. We've had a a question come in from someone that we've picked out. Um, So this has come from Neve in Ireland. What is your sort of top advice for actually working with your life partner? Oh, what a great question. (laughs) (laughs) Well, what I would say is um, you need to appreciate each other's strengths and and let's not say weaknesses, shall we just say less strong areas? (laughs) Because I think when you're in business with your life partner, uh, it can be quite tricky sometimes because the lines can get a little bit blurred. And, you know, I think when you're, if you're setting up a business or if you're in a more established business, I would take a long, hard look at where your natural skills sit um, and then try and divide your efforts and focus accordingly. So I'll give you an example. So Chris and I, in our property business, you know, I focus very much on um, the financial planning, tax, legal strategy, working with our investors, et cetera. So very much on, on that side of things. Chris is much more operational, finding the deals, negotiating the terms, you know, dealing with the, the sort of our, our building partners, et cetera, when we're doing refurbs and things like that. So we have quite separate, separate roles in our business, which we've defined. When we first started out, we were tripping each other up and, you know, we were kind of a bit of jockeying for position and, you know, all of that because you're finding your feet. So I think it's really important to, to do that. And then the other thing I would say is, um, it's it's harder when you run a business um, because it is your own money as well. It is different when you're when than when you're in a job, even in a very senior job. So your the lines between your personal life and your work life become much more blurred, which you know isn't a bad thing. But you also need to have clearly defined couple and family time as well, because otherwise you can find that you're 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 eating and, and sleeping and breathing the business, and all you're talking about is the business as opposed to actually going out and having date night or whatever it might be so I think also remember that if you're in business with your partner that is also your life partner and and those roles you know are different and I'm not saying you can completely separate the two nor should you but make time for each other as a couple um, as Mm. well outside of outside of the business yeah don't always bring it home (laughs) the the work right um and the second question we've had come in from Shalaya who's a budding uh, entrepreneur leading a, a very successful business at the moment. He asked, when you're leading huge teams, was there a particular activity you like to do um, for those teams to totally throw them outside of their comfort zone and, and kind Ooh. of develop that bond between um, the, the team? Brilliant question. I love this. Yeah. 
So I used to always love doing offsite events because, you know, when you when you're in a in a very high pressured business, which most of us are at certain points, either as a team member or as a leader, you know, you're 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 on the hook all the time, aren't you, for the performance, the delivery, and that can be quite stressful. So very often that can mean you don't get the creative space or the opportunity to spend time together. So at least once or twice a year, typically twice a year, I would take my team off site um, and we would have a day sort of strategy planning. So much more around brainstorming, big picture thinking, really allowing the team ideas to come out because when you're in the office in that environment, often you don't have the creative space to do that. So I think that's that has always been a really good, good way to sort of remove yourself from the normal day-to-day working environment, get creative, think longer term, not just the short term, but then also combine that with some really nice social things as well. So I'd normally do one or two nights away as part of that. We were very lucky because when I was in, in the travel industry, you know, very often when I'd go overseas, you know, I'd take the team over, you know, on a resort visit. So we'd combine some business, strategic planning, brainstorming and a nice social, um, you know, environment to take the boat out for the day or, you know, go on a beach barbecue, that kind of thing. But even if you're in the UK, you can still do that. And it doesn't all have to cost a fortune. You know, I remember in my earlier career, actually, when I was um, heading up the long haul program for, for TUI, you know, I didn't really have a budget. So I ended up, you know, bringing my team back to my house. We had an afternoon planning in the conservatory and then we got some beers in and, you know, so it doesn't all have to cost a fortune. Mm. Um, so I think even if you haven't got a big budget, you can still do things like that. But the principle of getting away from the normal environment to creatively allow people to be themselves, get to know each other, you get to bond over a beer in the bar where you're relaxed and you know people don't feel like they're they're always in a work situation I think that's when the best relationships can can be built 100% I love it um so moving into our final section of our interview with you today Jeanette and that's the quick fire round so just a a couple of uh, seconds on each question um and so we'll start with the first one do you believe luck exists I think you make your own luck Okay, great. Um, I agree with that. Uh, Number two, as a travel executive and veteran, what is your favorite or top travel destination? Oh, so difficult. Argentina. Argentina. Nice. And in that same vein, um, favorite airline? Oh, that is really difficult. Um, I love Emirates, actually. Emirates Mm. is good. Nice. Um, Is it better to be a big fish in a small pond or a small fish in a big pond? Small fish, big pond. No, big fish, small pond. <laughs> I've done both. I've done both. <laughs> big fish in a small pond is what we'll, we'll take. Um, and and lastly, um, we love to ask all our guests uh, this question as the closing closing question, which is, what are you most uh, grateful for this month? Oh, I am grateful this month for my mum because she's had some health issues um, over the last few months and she's through all of that. She's 84. She's my inspiration. And I am so thankful that I can spend quality time with her. So yeah, this month I'm particularly grateful for my mum, Doreen Linfoot. Oh, love it. Well, wishing, wishing her all the best. And thank you so much for uh, coming on Mission Makers today. We've learned a lot um, and I'm sure our audience has, has, has taken away some really, really top tips. And um, when you launch your mastermind program, we'll also put in a plug and encourage our listeners to sign up to that as well. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, everyone is welcome. I, I just love to help people. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, um, we'll speak to you very soon, Jeanette. Have a lovely day. Thanks, Farah. Bye. Okay. If you want to grab a copy of today's show notes, then head over to missionmakers.com forward slash Jeanette Linfoot, where you'll also find notes from all of our previous episodes. We've got some amazing guests coming on the show this season, so be sure to share the show with your friends and subscribe to us on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever else you listen to your podcasts. You can reach out to me at missionmakers or at dj.n1nja on Instagram. And if you're interested in supporting the show and getting some really cool rewards like virtual DJ lessons with me and exclusive merchandise, don't forget to visit patreon.com forward slash missionmakers. Thank you for listening. And until next time, keep it laser focused. <laughs>